Thank you for joining us this evening for the Adirondack Experiences third program in our Artists and Inspiration series. I'm Cheryl Ronstein, Director of Interpretation, and I'm thrilled to be coming to you live from the studio of Barney Ballinger. In 2023, the museum will be opening a new experience for our visitors, Artists and Inspiration in the Wild, the first permanent exhibition dedicated to our art and design collection with a makerspace that is being built under the vision and inspiration of Barney and based upon much of its collections and materials. Over the coming months, you'll be able to hear from scholars and artists, creative visionaries and committed staff through this monthly program dedicated to the new exhibition and its showcased collection, including the work of Barney Bellinger. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to one of our newest acquisitions. This is a, a wonderful piece by artist Barney Ballinger, best known for his rustic furniture and um, artwork. Um, and what I really love about this piece is that it really exemplifies his use of found materials and his ability to create these really interesting textural compositions using bits of found wood, metal, manufactured pieces like the fishing rod handles that you see. Uh, there's a bullet casing at the top. And this really wonderful painting that he did um, really shows off his love of fishing um, here and in Montana. Um, it's just a really wonderful piece that I could look at for a long time because there's so much to see. So Barney began his artistic career pinstriping and detailing motorcycles and uh, sign painting. And after a visit to the Adirondack Museum's uh, Rustic Fair in 1990, he turned his attention to rustic furniture making and built a really successful career. But he's multi-talented, so as you can see in this one piece, it's not just woodworking, it's also painting. And of late, he's been branching out into uh, sculpture using uh, found pieces of industrial metals, all sorts of materials that catch his eye. Um, intensely creative man and I really hope you enjoy his uh, studio tour. It's a fascinating place. Bonnie Bellinger, based here in Mayfield, New York, is both a painter and a furniture artisan. He started in the 1970s as a motorcyclist and is today both an active artist and a teacher to students with sensory processing disorders including his role as artist-in-residence at the Paul Nigra Center for Creative Arts. He experiences the beauty of natural light and changing seasons in remote natural landscapes from the Adirondacks to the American West, forging for raw materials to study natural forms and color. He has been exhibited at the National Museum of Wildlife Art, and his works can currently be seen at the Adirondack Experience, the, T the Wild Center, and the Tupper Art Center. He's also in the permanent, the permanent collections of the Adirondack Experience, the Orvis Company, and the Smithsonian Institution. He's also held by numerous private collectors. Before we get started, I do invite you to submit any questions this evening through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Barney. Barney, would you mind telling us a little bit about how you started as an artist? Well, let's see, that was 51 years ago, working in my father's garage and welding and uh, working on cars, motorcycles, gas tanks, and so forth. And for a number of years, we were painting and building motorcycles until 1979 and had a fire, which we lost all of our equipment. and materials so we moved gears into the sign making business and started the Barney Sign Company. We were actually carving, gold leafing and doing hand painted pictorials on our signs, both Saratoga region, historical regions and in the Thousand Islands, um, Clayton, Alexandria Bay and three regions north. 
So you've talked about a few places in the Adirondacks. Are there any special places to you? Where do you find your inspiration? Well, there's a lot of inspiration throughout the Adirondacks. And I might point out a lot of great artists throughout the Adirondacks. Um, I've always enjoyed hiking the West Canada's. It's Southwest Adirondacks. Um, head out into Sled Harbor, from Sled Harbor, go to Pillsbury. Remember Pillsbury into the West Canada region and then across to the Cedar Lakes. The terrain, the texture, the rivers and the water each have their own significant look. Whether it be more of a flatland, uh, like the Moose River Plains where the trees have been blown really hard and have a certain bend to them. And uh, actually the bend is kind of like this. And there, that's synonymous of that region right there, those trees, the, these big white pines, they all just want to tip and turn. And uh, that's great inspiration for the landscape. Um, everywhere you step out of your car and you get back in the woods, you can find inspiration. So it's out there, you have to go find it. And it's been a joy with hiking with my wife and friends and fishing, camping with the kids. Uh, we take our granddaughters and we set up our easels alongside of the lake or a river and the kids get to paint. And it, it just, uh, it's a lifestyle for us. It's not just about going out and trying to capitalize on that moment or putting stuff in an art show or attending a rustic furniture fair. It's deeper than that. I feel that if you're going to work on something, make it meaningful. Make it uh, um, something that when you finish, you're pleased, and the person that may purchase it is also very pleased and would like to have it in their home, camp, or cabin. So you don't please, you don't paint to please critics. Well, by saying I don't paint to please critics basically means that. I'm a self-taught artist. I don't pretend to be some great painter or school painter. I like to paint what I see and record my travels. Um, I feel that if you want to enter competitions and shows and jury shows, that's great. I mean, the paintings and the painters in this world today are beyond what I would ever dream of. I'm doing it, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying it. I don't have to answer to anybody. Just do what I do. I can paint the scene. I can paint the landscape. I can paint a river. I can paint fish. Who cares if it's not as good as the guy next to you? It's all about enjoying that moment and living that lifestyle and doing a good job at what you do, making it meaningful. So can you tell us, you've got a couple of pieces that are right next to you. It looks like one of them is a river, perhaps. Well, this, this is a little segment of a, of a river. And what I've been doing lately is changing the shapes of my paintings. Um, these narrow verticals. Um, all I'm doing is taking a snippet of, of a river with some nice boulders, some spruce trees, some pine trees, and focusing in on that and making it meaningful little piece that you can look at for a while and never be tired of it. Um, the new thing that we're doing also is I have a glass collection from the last 20 years. We are now taking glass and cutting it, laying it out to form and create landscapes. So this here is actually three pieces of glass. I can design the glass, select the glass based on its color and its form to look mountainous, perhaps a waterfall. And after I can create and pull these colors together in the shapes, I have a very skilled young artist, Sadie Dwyer, who helps me cut the glass and she uh, solders it for me. And uh, so we're kind of collaborative on that part of it. And it's been a really, a real joy to use all this glass that we've gathered for many years. So talk a little bit about the future and your work, especially with bringing up some young artists. You mentioned working with Sadie, some of the other young artists that you worked with. Well, 
I've had many that have started in my shops and studios. Um, Peter Winter, Chris Wagner, Half Fitzgerald, um, Harold Hamner, Paul Licata. Many of these guys have all been a part of coming and working or working together. And uh, hopefully, well, and I know for a fact that many of them have gone on to do some pretty cool things. I may inspire or teach them techniques, but it's up to the artists themselves to carry on and to continue with their journey as an artist and uh, creating their own original works. I, I, I really feel strong about having your own book and not mimicking or copying someone else, but be original. What about some of the students at the Paul Niger program? The Paul Niger program is a little different program. We work with steel over there, so the students come in and they get to choose all the metals that they want in my metal shop. And there may be 10 students, everyone gets a piece of metal. You can compose the metal in different forms and juxtapose it one against another, talk about it, discuss it. And it's really interesting to see the outcome because I kind of step back and just make sure everyone is safe, but that if they have a question, a technical question about balance or weight um, or the possibility of perhaps a danger or dangerous piece, uh, we may want to rethink it, but otherwise, um, it's about the students putting these pieces together and stepping back after I weld them in place and look at it and be proud and be happy about the creation that they just created as a group. I think I've heard as a couple of young budding artists that spend a lot of time with you in your studio. What about some of the work that they're that they've been doing? Well, that would be our granddaughters Claire, Rose, and Eleanor Horton. And uh, well, here's one of Claire's. She seems to like using wine corks and pine cones. There's even an old soda cap in here. So what they're doing right now is, is decorative arts and applied arts. And uh, no lack of color, of course. Um, Ellie, on the other hand, decides that she likes to paint and use her little watercolors. So here's a little watercolor that Ellie's been, been doing. And I think all collectively, we may have 40 or 50 pieces by our grandchildren. And uh, a few years ago at the Adirondack Museum experience, we did a painting demo and our granddaughter Claire did a painting there while I was working on a painting of my own. And that was quite a joy to get to share the piece with her. One of the things that strikes me, even looking at the works of your granddaughter, is your use of materials and texture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe some of the, how you bring the frame and the painted work and all of this together into a finished piece? Well, you know, found objects and then, of course, using the natural materials. Uh, perhaps this piece here is okay, slip falls. Uh, this one is palette knife painted, so I did not use a brush on this piece. This was done with a palette knife, the palette knife just slicking the paint on, so to speak. But then afterwards, our collections of roots and burls, we can encompass a frame and give it a freestanding exhibit. And someone could set this on a sofa, they could set it on a sofa table or on a dresser. It's um, just a, a new way and a three dimensional way of applying and displaying the flat work. So are you aiming for perfection? And bringing uh, all this together? I, I'm not aiming for, for, for perfection anymore. It seems like after 51 years, um, perhaps I'll go the other way. And just, I, I actually call a lot of my work now the Rough Country series, which means that it's really roughly done, textured, but at the same time, you have an overall look that feels like the natural world. And um, I've done enough of the tight detail that I really enjoy being very loose with my work. Even in my welding, I don't mind if the welds aren't perfect. It's about the shape and the form. And talk a little bit about that sense of contentment that you also are getting. 
bring how how the notion of contentment comes into the creative process. Content. Well, I guess I, I can't wait to get up in the morning and go do what I do every day, which is creating. I mean, it's 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 a blessing to be able to have a profession, a vocation that you can enjoy. And at the same time, it's a treasure hunt every day. And it's easy said now because it's 51 years later. I'm not sure how I would answer that question if I were 40 again. <laughs> One thing I love every time I have a chance to sit down with you is just hearing some of the stories that you tell. And, you know, even earlier today, you know, listening to you reminisce about the places that you been to with the Adirondacks and what you've seen and how it helps to shape your work. Could you share some of those stories? Well, it all begins as all of us as artists have to remember you can make a painting, you can make a piece of furniture and you can sell it, or you can do the same and make a friend and have a friend and a continued relationship. I have many clients that I have been friends with for 35, 40 years. We still can go and have dinner. So we've, we've built a meaningful relationship and at the same time, they've supported and appreciated the work that we do. And uh, I, it's a great fulfillment to be able to have that relationship. Maybe a camping trip, maybe a fishing trip. Uh, that's the key to growing as an artist. Can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done with you know, taxidermy and some old pieces and essentially how you're taking some old traditions and rethinking life into them? Well, my deconstructed taxidermy actually started when I visited an old taxidermy shop in Johnstown, New York, Bob's Taxidermist, and he had a bird up on the counter and they peeled the skin off to make a repair. And once I saw that, I went out and found a couple of old pieces of taxidermy and I started taking the, the skins and the feathers off to observe the anatomy and how great the anatomy and the procedure was to be able to bird, build a bird and then put the skin back on the bird that was custom made out of string, fiber, and in most cases, excelsior, which is a shaved pine. So, when I deconstruct a bird or a fish, it's not about doing something grotesque. It's about telling the story of the anatomy and the art and design of that old time taxidermy. Um, I have trout that have been mounted from the 1920s that were all hand carved wood bodies. And they had to be so right on that they would take the skins after skinning the trout and lay that skin over the form and there you go you have your taxidermy 1920s 1930s 1940s before they went into using styrofoam and other substrates what are you working on right now well actually i just started fiddling here on this little landscape it's kind of hot here today i think it's about 95 so it looks like i'm sweating a little bit it's not because I'm nervous. So this, just, just a basic little wash in. A lot of times when I'm painting, I'll wash in colors, get a form, get a shape, landscape wise. And then I'll start by perhaps working in some clouds. It's not that difficult. Um, you gotta be you know, loose with the brush and just let the paint flow. Have an idea of where you're headed first before you, before you take off. It's like, it's like a roadmap. If you're going on a trip, have an idea where you're headed before you start. And uh, I feel it's the same way with painting. Uh, I don't know about the, the real experts and what they have and what their approach is, but this has been working for me. As the Adirondack artist, your use of natural materials, and you can see in, in the frame that's over behind you, but the use of raw wood, um, you can talk a little bit about that. So this is, uh, again, here's a small vertical, another uh, 
one on canvas, which is more of a wash in, it's a little roughly painted. And the frame is yellow birch bark that we peel off from dead trees and then reassemble. This piece here, I would say there's eight different pieces of bark. It gives a really great texture. And when you're looking at the painting, it's almost like you're looking inside of a tree. Um, it has a really great feel. And uh, so I do enjoy working with these uh, yellow birch frames. One thing that we can't get into um, in this studio so much is your furniture. You can't uh, exactly hold on to furniture pieces. Um, we have posted your Facebook page, which features some of your furniture, but maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the other works that you've made. So this piece here almost feels reminiscent of a, of a piece of furniture. However, it's made with all vintage bamboo fly rods of various sizes. We drill and we pin every one with a brass pin. We have some figured sycamore here for a little architectural form. The frames are gold leaf and they're miterless corners. I had a, a husband and wife team in Missoula, Montana who would make just this liner for us. It was hand carved in gold leaf and then we could build that into our frames. The rest of the piece is again with all of the uh, eyes are left on the, on the rods. Hopefully these aren't like really valuable rods. I don't think so. I try to watch that. And uh, uh, we have the sycamore throughout and then I use a larger bamboo to frame the outer portion of the painting. So the painting itself, a little dirty. The painting itself is my tent camp at Lily Lake. And this was a guy book that I borrowed from a friend of mine, James Eidler. And I had a really interesting aqua teal interior color. Um, so I set tent camp up for three days and did studies uh, for the paintings in that area, which flows down into the Miami River. And uh, uh, great place, great place to be. I do want to encourage anybody who is watching, please do feel free to answer or ask some questions in the Q&A, and we can bring those up to Barney as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you were talking earlier about light and about mist, and if you can just try to evoke some of um, those qualities of the environment that really um, excite you, inspire you, connect you with the region. Well, I. I prefer a mood. I'm a moody person. And it's more about visual. Maybe maybe I'm a moody person anyways. I'm not sure. Um, you'd have to ask my wife that question. <laughs> but however, um, early mornings, a mist, a mood. I paint a lot of gray. I paint a lot of gray. I paint a lot of dark skies, gray skies, or warming it up maybe with a strong pop of blue, like this, this painting here. Again, it, it's more of a gray tone in the skies, and, and it's just this subtle washing of colors that pulls you into the painting. Um, I don't paint postcard days. Uh, big, beautiful blue skies and white puffy clouds. I don't know, it's never really attracted me, so I'm always looking for like a nice rainy day or after the rain, um, or a big temperature change. That, that I enjoy. And uh, that, that seems to inspire me quite a bit. It could be the smoke rise on a river where there's campers and you just had a rain and the smoke settles in the valleys. Uh, great opportunity to get some mood in those mountains. So we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one person wanted to hear again what you had said about um, the Miami River and where you said you were. They hadn't caught that question. So the Miami River, if you go Route 30 south of Indian Lake, you'll have Louis Lake. At Louis Lake, uh, which is where my tent camp was set up, you can go across Louis Lake and you can forge your way down through the back. You have to get a map and you can take the Miami River and you just follow it and wander it down through and end up in, in Indian Lake. 
And we have another question. Do you take photos and bring them back to your studio to complete a painting? Um, a lot of times I, I, I will take photos. I have about 1,500 so this book is full of treasures and it's everything from the American West to my tent camps to Susan and I camping the rivers um, and I would encourage any artist to just get out there and put a bunch of materials together in the truck and haul it in and set it up uh, these are all tent camp shops and rivers, waterfalls, okay, slip falls, uh, which is this painting here. Um, but, you know, remember at the same time, you don't always have to record what you see. You can use your liberty to make it look like where you want to be. So it's not always going by the book and saying, well, I, that tree is in the wrong place, so that mountain top shouldn't be there. Forget about that. Make an interesting painting. Any other questions? How much of a how much of a plan do you have when you begin a found object construction? Did you know where you were headed with the bamboo fly rod frame, for example? I actually did. Uh, that had to be thought out. That, that's just not one you can wing it and hope that everything works out in the end. So it hasn't worked out in the end, it probably isn't the end. Uh, you really, you have to plan those. The proportions have to be right, the balance. You know, I'll, I'll show this to our viewer once more. And we're certainly willing to, welcome to come make a visit. But this is balance. Um, I, I work hard at trying to get balance and get proportions right. Um, but we can't just put this together. The inner frame, the outer frame, the painting and the composition, it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. It's a challenge that teaches you things um, that help you in other furniture making. As a self-taught artist, can you talk a little bit about, especially when you're thinking about what you're learning and what you're teaching, what was, what was that like to experiment to reinvent yourself to reinvent the work of others and the evolution of that process i, I think now that um, it's 51 years for me looking back it's easy to look at it and have thoughts about how you did it but you have to imagine while you were there going through and trying to come up with this stuff you work endlessly you work anxiously and you always had to persevere and never be afraid to make what some people call a mistake. And sometimes mistakes are great. However, you just have to have an open mind and kind of know where you want to go. Do I want to work with furniture? Do I want to work with paintings? For me, I get bored, so I have to work on everything, metal, lighting, furniture, um, and it's spending time in the outdoors. If you're not inspired by your trips back in the back country, maybe you better do it. You also have a book in progress right now. That's a whole other project. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? 50 years of art and design is going to start from uh, the days of painting motorcycles. I started welding in my father's old garage when I was 14 years old. But we are going to go through and cover everything from the sign business, the motorcycles, the cars, then into the rustic furniture, and from the rustic furniture into back into the metalwork again. Um, we now have 17 pieces of steel sculptures at the Tupper Lake Wild Center. Most of those steel pieces are inspired by the plants of the forest, could be uh, pitcher plants, pickleweed, and various shapes and forms of the forest. Um, it, it's, it's really a nice opportunity and I'm really enjoying this whole steel production. This will be my last year of working with heavy iron and steel. 
Um, so it's kind of a nice way to wrap that up. You have some fabulous photos that have been from the that way. Do you want to show some of those? The photos? <laughs> the photos. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to show the photos. Um, they could go on my Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, they could see all the photos. Okay, I got it now. So this is the pickerel weeds. They grow around the edges of the ponds and the lakes and the uh, Adirondacks and various places. But if you notice, uh, laying in the water and shooting up through them, you can make them look very large and also look like steel sculptures. Um, that was my whole intent, was to try and mimic these and make the forms out of steel. So now we do have a collection that are inspired by the pickerel leaves. Um, this particular one here is really quite interesting. And this is the Osgood pickerels, shot on Osgood Pond. This is named Jay. It's from a very special client of ours, I was at their place invading their waters and photographing the pickerelies. But imagine this form is in nature. It looks like it's been drawn. So those are the little things that you can find for your inspiration. So a lot of your work is based upon your explorations and I want to dig into that a little bit more and just, um, you know, again, you, you've talked about some of the um, places that are particularly special. How do you go about discovering these things? And especially how are you linking between, um, you know, being um, a fisherman, working, a lot of your work is based upon that tradition um, and just that connection between your exploration and then what comes out as a finished work. Well, obviously you have to be very curious. That's that's key for any artist. Be curious. Once you're curious, then you can start searching for things that bring you uh, joy and satisfaction in shape and form. Uh, could be in the forest. Could be in a scrapyard. I like I like walking through a junkyard. There's a lot of inspiration. There are car fenders that could make the wonderful body of a, uh, of a, of a fish or um, perhaps even a milkweed. I get inspired by the milkweed. Stop and look at one. If you want help with your colors, take a look at the milkweed in the fall when it turns gold and has a gray outside. It's a natural, perfect fit. Wait. So, speaking of taxidermy, I'm working on this piece here, which is a found taxidermy fish head. At one time, it was a cigar or a cigarette ashtray. I cleaned it up and changed it, and I took an old piano, and I cut the top of the piano off, and now I'm going to hand letter it and hopefully come up with my own brand of cigars, which will be fish head cigars. So that's what this sign will be lettered up like. And uh, that should be fun. I mean, can you imagine sitting around with your buddies and saying, hey, hand me a fish head, will you? I think that would be pretty nice. So you have another studio that um, is is vast and, um, and full of all sorts of wonderful objects from glove forms to um, chocolates. <laughs> Maybe do you want to talk a little bit about just how you go about getting some of these um, these objects that you've acquired over the years and, and how they, to you, say this is going to become a work of art as opposed to what somebody else might think this is going to go in the trash? Well, I, I started. 20, maybe 15 years ago, collecting welding helmets. Um, everywhere we would go, 
whether it be out west or Key West or up in the Keys, I would always visit welding shops and buy the old welding helmets. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of that whole collection. I think I have 150 more than I should have. Um, but I want to take them all and, and put them on the side of a white barn. And it's about, I wonder what each individual that used that helmet, what were they working on? Were they working on art? Were they working on their dad's trailer? Mm -hmm. Were they putting a truck back together? Or were they making a signpost for the Adirondack experience? Who knows? But I wanna, I wanna put that story up, that storyline, all those welding helmets, and let's think about the men behind the mask. So for you, there's a deeply personal connection as well. Even though it's an object, there's a human story behind it. Exactly. Um, again, being meaningful. You know, have, have a thought in mind. We do have another question. Who are some of the artists that have inspired you? Uh, the other artists that inspired me would be number one, Winslow Homer. Um, Winslow Homer was a, a, a good, strong influence. David Smith as a sculptor. Um, it's interesting because I think people can inspire you, but if you have the materials, your materials speak to you and they help you get to where you want to go. If you, if you don't have the materials, you can't create unusual art. You, have, you can't sell from an empty wagon. You can't create art from an empty wagon. So I suggest, you know, that you have a lot of materials around you. I like a lot of stuff around me. I have a 10,000 square foot building and it's almost full. Um, so anyone out there listening, if you'd like to come and get some of it, please feel free. I'm mm -hmm. at that point in my life where uh, bring a pickup truck and we'll, we'll put some stuff in it for you. And you can come to the museum in 2023 <laughs> see some of it and I'll make your stage. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we did get another question. Have you ever started a project and thought you knew where you were going with it, but it didn't quite come together in the way that you had envisioned? Um, things always worked out the way you thought they would. I would have to say, honestly, that that probably happens 25% of the time. Maybe it's because I'm distracted a lot. I'm usually working, right now I'm working on 120 pieces in my welding shop and in my wood shop and on paintings. Um, I like to I like to study something, put it away for a while, then come back to it. Um, I bounce around, but when I have a deadline, the deadline is always met. Um, but that's just the way that I operate. All artists, I know another really fabulous artist, um, Randy Holden, I've had conversations with him, and he would prefer to work on just one or two pieces. And they're magnificent. That's his style. That's the way he likes to do it. Um, so everybody needs to find their niche and their speed um, as individuals. You have a long history with the museum's rustic furniture market. And I know that um, you've been a long time exhibitor there. And I, also, I want to hear a little bit about that, but also, especially you know, we have the event in 2019, we look forward to hosting it again this year. When you see some of those new up and coming artists and you think back about your years coming to an event like that and, and how the, the genre has changed, how the artistry has changed, what, is, what does it remind you of from your own past and where do you see all of this going in the future? I have to be careful about this one. <laughs> I, to be to be quite honest with you, when I go to the rustic show or other shows, I I prefer not to go out and wander very much. I stay in my own space, and I really don't want to know what other people are doing. Um, I don't know where it's headed or where it's going. I think, to be honest with you, I'd like to see rustic go right back to a a log and two supports and have people sit on it, call it a couch. Mm -hmm. uh, that's okay. Um, 
because everybody has a different take on what they're doing. The most important thing is try to be original. Don't do what somebody else has already done because that gets really tired and gets old. Um, but uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't chase after what's happening, so to speak. I kind of stay in my own world, and uh, I have friends that are out there and doing wonderful pieces. It's all great. Are there anybody, is there anybody that you like to collaborate with? You mentioned again, say you before, anybody else? Oh, there's, you know, I have different fellows that come in the shop and work, Joe Egg. Jonathan Sweet and I, Jonathan Malstein, sculptor, Carolyn Lommersdorfer, sculptor. Um, not that we've collaborated, it'd be fun to collaborate. Probably someday when we can slow down, maybe we'll all get together and do a piece. Mm -hmm. um, but these are people that are doing really great works that inspire me and challenge and raise the bar. You always have to have the bar raised to bring yourself up to that level and always have a willing heart to learn. I think that's what's always helped me is uh, if somebody's got something to say about what I'm doing or we could change this, I don't mind listening. Speaking of listening, I do want to go ahead and encourage if anybody's got any other questions. Bonnie, anything that you can think of that you want to make sure that people hear about? Well, we're having a show. We're having an art show in Tupper Lake at Tupper Arts Center with 35 pieces called Rustic to Modern. And then the steel and sculptural show at the Wild Center at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake. So that's going to be on all summer. And do you we do have another question? Do you show your techniques with students? I do. Um, yeah, I mean all the Others that have worked with me get to see the techniques every day when we're working together. Not so much anymore. My nephew Charlie Brown started with me when he was 12 years old. He's fantastic. Um, he is now 32 years old. And he still dabbles in his, his rustic furniture, but a uh, very qualified individual. Somebody wants to get a better peek at the image that you are, at the painting that you were working on. Oh, this here? Yes. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> it's basically, what's kind of fun is that, you know, have four or five pieces of various shapes of plywood around, and put a coat of primer on them, and just take some thinner, put some oil paints on your palette, and just get a brush and start playing. I, I used to get really nervous and when I was looking at a canvas that maybe 15 by 30, I would put it off and put it off and put it off because it just couldn't get started. So what I did is I, I tried to outsmart myself by having these little panels and it was not intimidating at all and I would just take the oils and I would take some thinner and a brush and just start to wash in some colors and that kind of eased me into working on a, on a more serious piece. All right, do we have any other questions for Barney before we go ahead and wrap up our evening's conversation? So I do want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. The Adirondack Experience is, we cannot wait. We are opening our doors to all visitors beginning July 1st. We've got a welcome back bash happening from 10 until 4. And for members, our last members only weekend is this upcoming weekend. We have lots of events planned in the weeks ahead. ahead. Our popular Monday evening explorations are back both in-person and streaming. And we have new events, including a World War II themed dance party, bingo, and live concerts. At the end of July, we can't wait to welcome you back under the evening skies for the return of our in-person gala and silent auction. 
please check our website for information on hours. We do still have COVID safety guidelines, and you can reserve tickets for any of these upcoming programs. Oh, and we've got one more question before we sign off. Um, so if somebody wanted to know about your, if you have any formal art training. No. <laughs> I actually, I went to a, a Y class once, I think, and I went two or three times, and I, I just couldn't stay focused enough to be able to do that. So you have a lot of struggles, but eventually you figure it out. Before we end this program, I, we do have a final word from the museum's director of institutional advancement, Sarah Lewin. Hi, everybody. We have raised over $2 million of our $4 million goal for the new upcoming exhibition, Artists and Inspiration in the Wild. For the first time in the museum's history, our nationally acclaimed fine and decorative arts collection will be on permanent display. We wanted to take this opportunity to make sure you knew you could support this exhibition that's coming in 2023. We have great naming opportunities and any gift can be spread over multiple years. Please contact us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barney. It's been a wonderful evening, and thank you to all of you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you back at the museum. Good night. Good night.